Thanks, worship team, for leading us today. Uh, I'm Justin. I'm the youth pastor here at Smoky Point Community Church. If we haven't met, it's good to good to see you all. Hello. Oh, what's up? Uh, hey, does anybody here like podcasts? Are there podcast people here? Okay, there's like like seven of you. Nice. Um, I've I've never really been a big podcast person. I've been trying to get into them. Uh, just just trying here and there. There's this one podcast. I I'm not a big fan of like the true crime stuff. Uh, it's too scary for me. Uh, not gonna lie. I'm I. It's a little scary. <clears throat> But there's this podcast series that I really enjoy. It's called Against the Odds, and it's survival stories. And what I love about these stories is you always know someone survives. So it's like there's always at least going to be some good ending. You know, it's, it's nice. But what they do is they look through history and they tell stories of people who, against all of the odds, made it. Uh, there's stories like the, the wildfires uh, <clears throat> down in Paradise, California, back in 2018. They tell that story. It's, it's, it's riveting. It's crazy. Um, the USS Indianapolis that sunk uh, in the Pacific Ocean in 1945, and men floated in the ocean for days before they, the, some of them were rescued. Uh, the Uruguayan rugby team in 1972 that crashed in the Andes Mountains, and against all odds, some of the these men survived. Crazy, crazy. Um, you might remember in 2018, the soccer team in Thailand who was in the caves and the, they flooded and they couldn't get out and were stuck for days uh, in the dark before they were able to scuba dive them out. Crazy, crazy story. You, you might also remember uh, or heard of in 2010, there were uh, miners in Chile who uh, when, when they drilled into the side of like an adjacent cavern that had water, it flooded the mine. And for almost 10 weeks, 33 miners were stuck under the earth. And I am sure they thought moment after moment, time after time, day after day, this is it. I'm done. But about 10 weeks later, they emerged from the ground. All of them survived. Crazy, crazy story. But I'm sure every one of these stories, <clears throat> they, they had a moment, I'm sure, where the person was like, it's done. I'm, I am over. My life is forfeit. This is the end. And then when they survived, I imagine that every single moment became precious. Every moment was precious because they knew my life was gone. I've been to the brink. I've experienced it. And now I'm alive. And every moment is a sweet gift. We're in the summer series called The Target. And this series is all about walking through our statement of faith uh, and we're looking at things that unite us, the center of the target. There might be things on the outside that uh, we as Christians maybe even think differently about some different theological concepts or practices that we do uh, to, uh, to like do church. But there are things at the center where it's like, these are the things that we undoubtedly agree on. And when we stray from these things, we begin to look like a different branch or even a different plant, a different faith tradition entirely. And it's cool because in this world that is so polarized, so divided, we can look to these things and say, yes, you are my brother and sister in Christ because we, we cling to these things that are so central to who we are as Christians. And today... I want to talk to us about sin. And before I even dive in, I want to tell you the good news. In fact, we've been singing all about it over and over already. Uh, it's not like a, hey, I'm going to try and tell you something at the end that you've never heard of. Um, it, this is the gospel that God created us to know and love and be with him. But sin got in the way. <clears throat> And Jesus fixed the problem. That's like the shortest way you can say it right there. Jesus went to the cross. He took on our sin. He made a way for us to be in a relationship with God. It is already finished. Amen? Amen. 
1 Peter 2.24 says this, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you have been healed. We were lost, but Jesus has saved us. We were condemned, but now we are made righteous. But if you're anything like me, it is sometimes easy to forget. <clears throat> Your story might not be the exact same as mine, but uh, I'm uh, on Tuesday, I turned 33, and I came to know, love, and follow Jesus when I was, I said it a couple weeks ago, a wee lad, uh, and I actually don't remember a time in my life where I was not a Christian, where I was not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I, I have like maybe vague memories, but like I don't really, like when I write out my testimony, I don't say, man, this is life before Jesus. This is what it looked like. I'm like, well, I can't really even remember that. You might have that similar story, maybe. Maybe you just came to know Jesus in the last couple weeks or months. Awesome, that is so incredible. And I imagine that, that your life before Jesus is acutely in your brain. Uh, don't worry, this message is still for you as well. Um, but maybe you've been following Jesus for years and years. Maybe you came to know him when you were 28 years old and now you're 62. And it's been a long time following Jesus. And that life before is in your memory, but it's not like right there in the front. And sometimes it's easy to forget what God has saved us from. The one danger of growing up in the church like I did a danger that we face as being what I call a church kid is that sometimes God's grace can become unamazing. Not that it actually has changed, but in our point of view. It's like if your life is saved because your headphones were in and you were texting and you tried to cross the street, but somebody stopped you because a car was coming by. It's like, oh, oh, take my headphones out, put my phone away, go on in my day. My life was forfeit, but somebody saved me. But did you really know? <laughs> it was so quick. It was just this moment. Compared to these miners in the depths of the world who faced absolutely the end, and they knew every moment was a gift. They could cherish every moment. I sometimes feel like the person that's distracted walking across the street, and I forget what Jesus has done. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk about sin kind of on this theological level. I'm, I'm not even going to like dive in and be like, well, this is and this is and this. Like, that, that's not the point of this message. The point of this message is for us to understand the idea of, of sin, our sin nature on a theological level. And it's not, it's not trying to like be some masochistic like, woe is me. But if we understand the depth, the width, the severity of sin and its rule in our lives and the lives of humanity, the more that we understand our sin, the sweeter our salvation will taste. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that we already have proclaimed the truth, that you have already won. You conquered sin and death. You went to the cross. And God, we are so thankful Lord, open our minds to your word that we might behold wonderful things from you, that your spirit would be speaking to us, that it would be speaking through me, that these would be your words and not mine. God, teach us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to be reading uh, and diving into a text, Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> And so if you have your Bible, you can open there. It'll also be on the screen if you want to look along. Um, but I, I'd love to just begin also by reading our, from our statement of faith, our statement on, it's not really just the statement on sin. It's like the statement on humanity and the nature of, of mankind. So I don't have it in my notes, so I'm going to have to look at it over here. The nature, oh, it's back there. The nature and condition of mankind. Man was originally created in the image and likeness of God. He fell through disobedience, incurring thereby both physical and spiritual death. All men are born with a sinful nature and separated from the life of God and can be saved only through the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The portion of the 
Uh, the portion of the impenitent and unbelieving is existence forever in conscious torment, in that of the believer in everlasting joy and bliss. <clears throat> Let's read Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 21. We're just going to read the whole passage just to have it all in our mind. Then we're going to look closer at a few different parts, okay? <clears throat> Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin was indeed, or was indeed, was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one, who, uh, by the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul uh, gives us a picture of, of sin here that we're going to take a look at. And, and I just want to maybe even start with a, a very basic understanding of what sin is. Uh, sin is, uh, the way of, a way of describing sin rather, is that our great and holy God has made a standard and we have missed the mark. God has set a standard of perfection and we have missed the mark. Sin is any time we have missed the mark. It's not just things we commit, like robbing a bank or lying to someone or disobeying our parents, uh, but uh, sin is also things that we omit, things that we see that are good and righteous and should do, and we avoid and we don't do it, when we ignore the needs of others, like God invites us to do. Uh, sin's not just our actions, but it's also the attitudes of our hearts, the things that we think, the things that are going on in our hearts, like lust, like anger. <clears throat> so Paul is going to describe sin in, in a few different ways. And we're going to look at that. And the, and the first thing that we get to see is the entrance of sin in verse 12. Verse 12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin began in the garden. You see, God has always existed. He's an infinite and holy, perfect being, and he always existed. And then in the beginning, he spoke, and everything started existing. Everything else was created, and God created everything that was good, and, and then he created Adam and Eve, and they were very good. The crown jewel of his creation is humankind made in his image. And he said, hey, I want you, I want you to, well, he probably didn't say it like that, like, hey, uh, but, but, God, but God said, hey, eat of, of all of the trees here, eat of all of the fruit that I have given you, live in this garden with me in perfectness but don't eat of this one tree. And Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. And they did exactly that. They ate of the one tree. Uh, Genesis chapter three, verse seven and eight 
shows us the result of what happened when sin entered into the picture. It says, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths. The first thing that happened was shame entered the picture and they needed to cover themselves. They understood right away, I have done something wrong. Verse eight says the next thing that happens. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Before they sinned, they walked and existed with God and it was perfect relationship, perfect harmony. Everything was right. But when they heard God, they ran and they hid. And their relationship was no longer one and together, but it was separated, broken, severed. Their response was shame and hiding, and they retreated from God. Now, if you are either not a believer, or maybe you're, you're new to this whole Jesus thing, maybe you uh, gave your life to Jesus sometime recently, you might have this picture of who God is, as this angry tyrant father who when, when, when we have done wrong, comes at us yelling like, what have you done? But this picture that, I, I, I'm not even gonna read it, but, uh, but it's so beautiful. God invites, he asks them three questions. He says, where, where are you? Not like a, where are you? But like a, where are you? Of course God knew. He was inviting them to repentance. He says, where are you? What, what have you done? Not like a, what have you done? But, but what, what have you done? Tell me. God already knew. <laughs> He didn't have to ask, but his ask was an invitation. He says, where are you? What have you done? Why, why are you hiding from me? And he invites them in this beautiful picture. Right when this happens, his invitation is beautiful and gracious and loving. That is the kind of God that we serve. But our God is also righteous and what was once beautiful and perfect was now marred and broken. And in order for God to keep his righteousness, he had to punish his creation. And they received condemnation. They received death. And they were uh, excused, sent away, banished from the garden. And sin entered the picture. The nature of humanity as its, as its whole entirely changed. No longer were they perfect, but like a virus that spreads, it infects every part of their human existence, their bodies, their very souls, utter corruption. And the more that we understand that, the more that we understand sin, the sweeter our salvation tastes. But you might be thinking, Justin, that was then. That was how many thousands of years ago. Adam and Eve were walking in the planet, on this planet, but I'm here today. How, how, how does that connect with me? Paul talks about that in Romans chapter five. Let's keep reading. He says, therefore, just as sin, uh, in verse 12, just as sin came into the world through one man, that one man being Adam, in death through sin, so death spread to all men, not like just all males, like he's talking like all mankind, just, to, just so we're all clear there. He's saying all mankind. Uh, and, and he think about it, he didn't actually have to say, he didn't have to say uh, all uh, men. He could have just said all. He could have just said mankind, but it's almost like this double emphasis, this like, yep, it was everyone, everyone. Uh, for, verse 13, for sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though, even though over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So first we see the entrance of sin into the world, and then we start seeing the extent. Like, okay, sin entered the picture, but how far did that go? How far did that really go? All of humanity was wrapped up in this moment with Adam and Eve. As our representative, we, you and I, sinned with Adam. 
not guilty for exactly what he did, but his nature, his sinful nature was, we were so wrapped up in this moment that he as our representative sinned and so we sinned. And we enter into this world guilty before God of already missing the mark of what God has set. Wait, who? What? That was Justin. That was, that was, that was then. Those were those people. But what? What? What about me? Death spread to all mankind, as Paul says. No one is excused. No one is excused. In fact, if you look at all of Romans, we're in chapter five. If you read chapters one, two, and three, Paul is just building this case over and over again. He's saying, all have sinned. All have fallen short. Nobody has done it perfectly except for Jesus. A New Testament scholar, Leon Morris, says it like this. He says, For a grain of evil seed was sown in Adam's heart from the beginning, in how much ungodliness it has produced until now, and will, and will produce until the time of threshing comes. Oh, Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned, the fall was not yours alone, but ours also, who are your descendants. This was our original sin. And every sex, sub, subsequent, excuse me, every subsequent person is born with this departure from our original state of peace with God, and by very nature, our very core identity before Jesus is that we are sinners. Not just them out there, me, you, everyone at our very core, sinful by very nature. Even before we have yet to rob a bank or disobey our parents or lie to someone or lust, we are guilty through and through. If sin entered the world and sin extended to every person, then that means you and I have not escaped. It means that the same fate of Adam and Eve, we are liable for that same fate. Fate. Now, if you are sitting here and there's some hesitation in your heart, there's maybe some, some, something in you that says, well, wait a second, Justin. How am I liable before I've even done anything for something someone else did? We live in this very individualistic society where we cling to the truth that it's like, well, this is, this is on me, right? I'm, I'm not responsible for what, for what you've done. It's like, no, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is me. In our individualisticness, this idea that Adam sinned and I suffer is a tough pill to swallow. An ancient writer put it this way, each of us has been the Adam of his own soul. And, and I'll, be, I'll be honest, it is hard to digest that truth. It's hard to wrestle with this fact that like, man, somehow my existence, my nature was wrapped up with Adam as my representative, that, that first man, that my existence was somehow wrapped up with him. But I wanna challenge you, if, if it's hard for you to swallow that pill and wrestle with that idea, it might also be hard for you to wrestle with the idea that one man could have, taken your place and represented every other person and done the righteous act and taken your place so that while he suffered, you live in righteousness. Paul's whole point in this passage is he's putting these two ideas right next to each other. And when you put them next to each other, it's really hard to say, oh yeah, I, I want one and not the other. The more that we understand our sin, the sweeter our salvation will taste. But Justin, I've lived a pretty good life. Uh, I, like, I'm, I'm not the worst person. Uh, I, I, I'm not the worst. You look throughout history, and you will find some very horrible people, and that is true. Uh, I, I will be honest, I don't, I don't feel like my life has been as horrible as every person in history. I could name a lot of people who have lived a lot more horrible lives than you and I. So how could we be lumped into this same category 
that every person has incurred the same fate as Adam and Eve, death and condemnation. How can we be lumped in to that same category? Paul talks about the entrance of sin. He talks about the effects of sin, or sorry, the extent of sin. And then now he's going to show us the effects of sin. And the effects are death and condemnation. Adam, uh, in verse 14, is a type of the one to come. At the end of verse 14, you'll see him say, uh, Paul say, um, the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one to come. Adam was the first Adam. Jesus was the second Adam. Adam was the first Adam in that he represented all of humanity and failed. Jesus was the second Adam in that he represented all of humanity, yet he succeeded. And Paul then goes through this really dense comparison of the two works of these two men, the the first Adam and the second Adam. And he compares them together and he contrasts them and he talks about, okay, here's some ways that they're similar. Here's some ways that they're different. Uh, Here's how one is better than the other. And it's really dense and it's really cool. And what I've decided to do is I've tried, I'm a very visual person. And even just like reading through this chunk of, of scripture, it's kind of like, wait, what's going on? It's confusing. And so what I did is I've color coded on the screen the passage. So we have the works of the Adam in red, the works of Christ in green, so that you can see both of them on the page separately. So let's look at verse 15 and 16 and see the effects of sin. But the free gift is not, I'm actually going to look up here so I can see the red and the green. Um, But the free gift, that's the work of Christ, is not like the trespass, the work of Adam. For if many died through one man's trespass, see, many people died through Adam's sin, including you and I, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Here's that much more. Paul is saying, look how much more, look how much more abundantly and amazing is the grace of God compared to the work of Adam, the sin that has pervasively entered all of our lives. Verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one man's trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses, excuse me, brought justification. It's beautiful that Paul is showing, look at this. The work of Adam has brought condemnation, but the work of Christ has brought justification. When you put them next to each other, we're able to see and say, oh my goodness, how incredible and how wonderful and amazing is this grace of God, that one has brought condemnation, the other has brought justification. This idea of condemnation, though, I, I think it would be helpful to explain what, what condemnation, because you might be thinking like, well, I'm, I'm, how am I condemned, Justin? In a legal standing before God, one day all of us are all going to have to stand before God and account for everything that we have done. And we, without Jesus, stand Condemned because of the work of Adam, because of the sin, that sin nature that has been passed down and the sin that we commit, we stand condemned. But Jesus comes in and he says, I can make you justified because I can take the punishment that you owe. But we see the effects of sin that we have received condemnation. Verse 17 you want to click to the next slide. For if because of one man's trespass, that's the work of Adam, death reigned through that one man. We receive condemnation and we receive death. Through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This death is portrayed as this ruling figure. It it reigns over our life in such a way that is inescapable. 
unavoidable, and it dominates every part of our life. And, it's, and Paul's not just talking about a physical death, although that was absolutely part of it. Humanity before Adam and Eve sinned was not made for dying, but afterwards, death is a reality that we will all experience until Jesus returns. But also spiritual death, this separation of, from God that I already talked about, it was this death of this relationship, this separation from God that started with Adam and Eve and it continues today. C.S. Lewis, has, uh, who's, who's one of my favorite theologians, um, you might know him from the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, great book series. He has uh, this quote that I want to read to you because it's, 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 it's really interesting and kind of funny. Uh, he has this interesting argument that death was not inevitable for our first parents. Man, as originally created, was immune from death. At that time, his spirit was able to keep the forces of disillusion at bay. The spirit was once not a garrison maintaining its post with difficulty in a hostile nature, but was fully at home with its organism, like a king in its own country, or a rider on its own horse, or better still, as the human part of a centaur was at home with the equine part. Where spirit's power over the organism was complete and unresisted, death would never occur. When God created man, he gave him such a constitution that if the highest part of it rebelled against himself, he would be bound to lose control over the lower parts and in the long run to suffer death. Never thought you'd hear, hear a comparison to a centaur uh, in a sermon, did you? Neither did I. Uh, but when you're C.S. Lewis, I guess that's what you can do. <clears throat> Let's look one more, uh, one more slide uh, looking at Romans chapter 5, looking at the work of Adam versus the work of Christ to see the effects, the effects of sin on our life. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, again, that's all mankind, so one act of righteousness will lead to justification and life for all of mankind. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's disobedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, in case you are confused, when you read verse 18, if you just read that verse and don't know anything else about the Bible, you might say, well, Christ died on the cross. That means everybody is saved. And that would mean uh, that's, a, that's a universalist position. But here's the reality, is that Paul has been building a case over and over throughout the whole book of Romans that says, no, faith alone, grace alone, is the only way that somebody is going to be saved. Through grace alone, by faith alone. And so if he were... Uh, if he were trying to give this position says, well, every, that means, this means everybody is saved, uh, he would be contradicting himself, which Paul is not doing. What Paul is doing, though, is he's making this comparison. He's saying, look, whoa, uh, look, every, uh, there, so, everybody has sinned, but how much, more has, uh, how much more has Christ's work abounded for many people? He's just putting these next to each other to show us how much greater Christ's work is in the power of life over death. So here's the point. Regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, the punishment for sin that all of us cannot avoid is death and condemnation. Not just death here and now, but death in eternity, eternal punishment in hell. But remember what I start, where I started with, that that's not the end of the story. Praise be to God that he has saved us, that he has made a way. But you might be thinking, Justin, that doesn't sound very fair. This doesn't, this doesn't really sound very, very fair because you've seen, Justin, how horrible people can be. And I imagine you have as well. Have you read any history, Justin? I am no murderer. I am no abuser. I have barely committed any sin compared to them. My sin is not like those people. My sin is not like those people. And we point the finger 
outside of these walls and we look at everybody else that has sinned far worse than me. We say, how's that fair? To be lumped in the same category as those people. I, I, I know that's maybe shocking for you to hear or even consider, but I've seen the comments, the words thrown around. I know that these are attitudes that are so easy for us to slip into and hold where we say, look at how good I am and look at how horrible they are. But Paul clearly teaches, it doesn't matter. We've all sinned. We have all fallen short. The work of Adam has invaded every part of who you are, just like them. This doesn't sound very fair, Justin. I, I don't feel like I've done very much. I haven't done these crazy atrocities. How is it that I incur the same punishment that somebody else does that has done far worse than me? Imagine it this way. Imagine a kid on a hot day at school. It's maybe September. Sorry for those of you who are about to start school. My bad. I, I know. I know. It's, it's coming. You'll be okay. Uh, but it's a hot day at school. They're bored. They're sitting at their desk, and there's like a fly buzzing around. Capture this fly, and this kid is bored, and so he rips off the wings of one of the, one of the wings of the, the fly and lets the fly just like buzz around and like <laughs> laughs at it. Some of you are like, ooh, Justin, that's weird. Yes, I agree. That is strange. But should this kid be punished? Probably not. It's a fly. We swat flies all the time. It's just a fly. We haven't really offended flies around the world, have we? If someone were to do something similarly horrible to a cat or a dog, we would all hope that this person would be punished due to animal cruelty, right? Why? It's because punishment should, uh, should uh, equate to the being that is offended. The punishment should reflect the being offended. And we all know that when one human harms another human, it's a whole different story. The justice should be served and the punishment should fit the crime against the highest level of being humans. But I want you to remember that there is a higher being than us. The God of the universe, infinite, perfect, and holy. And he has a standard and we have missed the mark. And if you've missed the mark at all, because he demands perfection, Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. If you've fallen short once, you have offended the highest being, infinite and holy, which means the punishment should reflect the being offended. So our punishment is eternal. It is infinite. Justin, this doesn't sound fair. Well, when we imagine offending a holy God, it suddenly is like, yeah, no, this makes sense. This makes sense. All of us have sinned. All of us have earned death. It doesn't matter if you've done pretty good this year or last year. When we understand our sin, the more that we understand our sin, the sweeter our salvation tastes. Because if you have said yes to Jesus, he has rescued you from condemnation, from death that we all deserve. And it has nothing to do with how awesome you are. It has nothing to do with any good works that you have done. It is because Jesus went to the cross and by a free gift of grace has offered you salvation. And, it, and we by faith say yes to him. And he rescues us and he transforms us. 
and he gets all the glory. And when we remember how far and how deep uh, we were in our sin, not because we have, like the idea of total depravity um, is this theological idea, does not just say, say that we have done everything and the absolute worst that we possibly could do, but it describes that we have no ability to save ourselves. When we remember that, when we understand that on like a, on a mental level, the taste of salvation tastes so sweet. And we forget, when we forget where we've come from, it's like, oh yeah, God's grace, it's, it's pretty amazing, I guess. No, it is so, so amazing. Psalm 103, 11 through 13 says this. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. So there's a few different ways that we could respond to this truth, but here's what I would love for us to do. Firstly, if you are here and you are not a follower of Jesus, maybe you're just checking out this whole church thing. Maybe you've been wondering uh, about life, about purpose, about meaning. Uh, maybe you've been wrestling with your own sin. Maybe, maybe your sin is like acutely, you are acutely aware of it. You're like, I know I have done wrong, Justin. My invitation to you is the invitation from Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. His salvation is near. Uh, Hebrews chapter four says, today, if you hear his voice, respond to him. Don't, don't harden your heart like God's people did in the Old Testament. Today, say yes to Jesus. Commit your life to him. Receive the grace and the forgiveness that he so freely gives. If you don't know like what that means, uh, at the end of the service, we always have people up here who are willing to pray with you. Uh, if uh, you can come up to one of us and say like, hey, I wanna say yes to Jesus. We'll walk you through that. If you came here with a friend or you know someone, ask them. Love to walk you through that. It's between you and the Lord, but sometimes it's really helpful to have somebody who's just a little ways ahead of you to lead you and guide you through that process. For the rest of us, if you know, love, and follow Jesus, here's what I would love for you to do. The band's gonna come up and uh, we're gonna respond with one last song, one last song of worship that, that reflects affection towards Jesus for what he has done. And, and I would love for you to spend some time reflecting and remembering what God has saved you from. Not, not even like think about your story of like, oh man, what was my life like before Jesus? You could totally do that. But like for me, I, I can't even remember that. What I can do is I can think about these ideas that Paul has laid out and said, without Jesus, because of Adam, because of your sin nature, you are completely and utterly helpless. Death and condemnation rule and reign in your life. And without him, that's our reality. And when we remember that and when we understand it, our salvation is so sweet and it turns into worship because we say, thanks be to God that you have saved me. And it motivates us to go out and tell others this good news because others so desperately need to hear it. One of the ways that we do this regularly to look to the cross as a church community is we uh, take communion. And what that is is a, 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 a ritual that Jesus has instituted, this act of when you gather together, remember the cross by eating of some bread and drinking of some wine or some juice in this case, and remembering the work of the cross. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sing. And I'd love for you to get up. There's a station in the two in the back and two up here. Grab the elements. There's uh, both in cups. There's a cup of bread and a cup of juice. Bring them back to your seat. 
Uh, and then in the middle of the song, we will, we're going to uh, take communion together, and we're going to remember together. So through song, through the act of communion, through prayer on your own, let's remember together the sweetness of the salvation that we have in Jesus.